great. Thanks very much, Scarlett. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm excited about this workshop, and I've really enjoyed uh, being part of some of the research that's uh, going on in the Joint Research Center. Um, Scarlett asked me to, to speak today about uh, a human-centered AI perspective that we take at Microsoft Research and across actually Microsoft more, more broadly, and how it connects to some of the robustness and reliability related issues were uh, that are critical to applications of AI today. Um, so I hope you enjoy this talk. I know we're uh, not a very large group. If at any point anyone wants to interrupt and ask a question, obviously feel free or we can hold questions toward the end. So uh, we see uh, all around us that computing is being integrated into so many parts of our society and AI based data driven decision making is actually transforming uh, health, medicine, industry, retail and, and many other uh, parts of our society. These AI driven systems are really starting now to interact with and impact the real world. And as AI gets into some of these more critical application areas with real consequences, it's that much more important for our AI to be robust, for it to be reliable, for it to be safe, for it to be secure, and for it uh, to be something that really we can trust. And there are many challenges in the way of AI uh, really achieving that trustworthiness in all of the areas where we want to apply AI. I mean, some are algorithmic. We know that our conventional correlational machine learning methods really are all about finding patterns in data. And we know that they often find spurious patterns. This causes problems when those spurious patterns aren't reliable. It reduces accuracy in, um, in tasks. We, when, um, for example, uh, uh, we know that MNIST digit recognition fails when, when the digits are rotated in certain ways. We know that we can fool uh, many of our best language models when we uh, make uh, semantically equivalent perturbations to the input data. We know that this causes biases in, in models that are built for decision making. The problem with spurious patterns is that, that um, sorry. Yeah, so, um, but I want to emphasize that, that even though we often think about AI and machine learning in particular from an algorithmic perspective, we think about what we can do to improve the loss functions, the architect, the neural architectures that we use to build these AI systems, that the problems here around robustness aren't only an algorithmic problem. They're not only even a data problem. We take, I think, when we step back and take a broader perspective and think about how we design our AI applications and bring them to bear on a particular challenge, uh, we see that when we're designing this, we're collecting data, we're modeling, uh, applying our algorithms and, and creating an application, behind each of these steps, there's actually a person of some kind. Uh, when we're initially designing the application, it's uh, people who are deciding what the application should actually be doing. You know, it's people who are uh, getting the data. The data is driven often uh, um, from a crowd of people, and we have to ask where the data came from and what that implies about uh, the biases that might be in the data. Uh, causing patterns that we don't want our algorithms to, to learn from, um, and the ethics of, of what it means for that data to, to come from a group of people and whether everyone is getting um, whether everyone is getting uh, uh, the benefits uh, that that uh, they should be. When we look at the algorithm, of course, we ask whether it's generalizable, whether it's explainable, whether people can understand what it's doing and justify it. And when we look at the application itself and the system, we have to think about whether it's secure, whether it's it's fair, whether the options available to the AI embedded in this application are, are, are just. And oftentimes we have very complicated, broader societal consequences that come across um, uh, because of the use of this application. Now, one of the things that I appreciate about uh, being at Microsoft Research is our connections to the rest of Microsoft. And in particular, uh, in the area of, of human-centered AI, we've been able to build up an infrastructure, an ecosystem inside Microsoft that crosses between the product groups and research that helps us connect research with some of these core challenges and motivate and increase the impact of our research. Um, we have, in addition, we have three pillars 
in this uh, uh, responsible AI ecosystem. One is a group that we call Ether. These is, this stands for AI and engineering ethics, uh, F, uh, F, AI ethics and, this is a mouthful, AI and uh, ethics in AI and engineering research, a loose acronym. Um, and this group really um, drives our research perspective and uh, our understanding of what responsible AI means, what the critical factors are, and how we can go about, um, how we should go about thinking about how we change the way we, we work at Microsoft and across the industry to make sure that, that the AI systems we build are responsible. We have an engineering pillar called RAISE, where uh, uh, that is uh, then works with our product teams and our platforms to build out the capabilities in our in our in our software to make sure we can provide that res uh, that responsible AI uh, robustness and reliability that we want. And then we have a governance section, uh, an office of responsible AI that that really sets out the policies and makes sure that that we follow the processes and procedures that we need to. Now all of these these three pillars work together, and we find and this allows uh, us in research to learn about the key problems that people are facing, um, and look ahead and influence what we're doing now to make sure that we avoid problems in the future as well. It's I find it really motivating, and I and I know that it, it, it's increasing the impact of of the work uh, that that we do in this area. Over the next few slides, I know I gave a very high level overview of some of the application design process and how it connects into with, with uh, the people behind the, those processes. Over the next couple of slides, I just, I'm just gonna spend maybe one, maybe two slides on uh, a couple of selected projects to give you examples of how we can do research and move the needle in some of these more human-centered aspects of, of applications of AI. The first project I want to highlight is a uh, is work done by um, is work done by a new by Salima Amershi and her colleagues in an uh, in a new um, human and AI experiences team. So this is work done on uh, AI application design guidelines that try to give best practices for how to design uh, um, the interaction that goes on between an AI and a human in the context of um, uh, of of an application, and uh, it's easy to think about this. I think as a as simply an HCI or user interface problem, but that actually would not be correct. Um, many of the ways that we want to design an AI uh, an application that interacts with a person involve really deep architectural changes reaching back not only into the the data that we gather the the way that we set up the algorithmic challenges but even into the architecture of the system and the the core you know the ways that we monitor its use and make sure that it's not making making mistakes um so the guidelines for human ai interaction really talk about uh, what we need to be doing when uh, we're initially building the system how they when the ai is interacting directly with the human how we deal with mistakes when they happen, and how we continue to evolve the system and learn over time. The types of, um, um, there are 18 generally applicable design uh, guidelines, and, and some of the principles here, for example, um, are about how we uh, make sure we match the AI's behavior to relevant social norms, how we mitigate social biases, um, 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 and how we, for example, make it easy to correct for a human to correct mistakes when something goes wrong and make it easy for us to know that something is going wrong so that we can fix the overall system. Going to the next, uh, um, once we've designed the system and we start gathering the data necessary to train our AI models, it's critical that we understand where this data comes from and that we consider the many, many different kinds of data biases that can exist. Um, one of my favorite resources for, for thinking about the kinds of data, the kinds of biases that can exist in data and how uh, many of these biases are tied back to um, the people that generated this data in one way or the other through collection, through their interactions with pre-existing computer systems, is a, a survey by Olteano et al. that was published in 2019 on social data uh, biases. 
And here, this uh, this paper does a really good job of of going through the stages of um, how we create and collect data and process it and use it for a particular application, and tying each of the and giving a taxonomy of the the ways that um, the choices that we make through this process affect the data. Um, Alexandra is at uh, uh, MSR Montreal right now and continuing this uh, line of work of trying to understand some of these complex interactions between um, between between data and AI systems and their implications. Now, uh, of course, uh, when we're taking our when we're taking our uh, perspective on uh, a human-centered perspective on AI, we're not only trying to understand how the way we currently work and build these AI systems is um, causing potential problems or 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 uh, is affecting uh, the the end result of the system we're building. We also care about making sure that we can create new mechanisms to bring in the human perspective when necessary. One of these these methods is actually uh, causal machine learning. This is something that 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 uh, uh, is closer to, uh, is close to, to my area. In causal machine learning, we these methods aren't only about taking the data uh, uh, that we have available about a system or an environment and using it to provide robust uh, um, um, a, a robust AI solution. It's also about making it easy to bring in the external domain knowledge, our prior knowledge about a system, and use that to guide the machine learning methods to learn the, the correlations that are going to be more robust over time, that have some tie into the underlying mechanisms of a system. Um, so um, how do we integrate that external knowledge? There's many different ways of doing it, but again, this is about making it easy for that human influence to, to come in and make sure that our AI systems are better. That last stage, we've built the system, we've built the model, and now we have an application that's interacting with people. How could this go wrong? There are so many ways. Uh, there's a recent webinar by Blodgett and Olteanu on failures of imagination uh, that give some really great examples of how we can be surprised uh, by, in this case, language technologies and how they can uh, cause harms that we might not have a priori thought about. So, for example, if we're in a, a search system and we're looking at the auto-suggest uh, bar, it's easy for us to, to think about the correct behavior of this auto-suggest bar as being about, um, ab about suggesting queries that people are going to, to click on with, with, with um, high likelihood. But actually, there's other types of harms that we need to, to consider. It's not just about whether someone ends up clicking on this auto suggest or not, but we have to think about the 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 um, downstream implications of this and the implication. Uh, so, for example, in auto suggest, if I ask, should I do something? It's really great if it um, asks if it suggests, you know, should I buy a car, or cut my hair, or maybe this this one about lyrics. But it's really not so good if it asks me, uh, if it prompts me to to uh, um, to ask about uh, suicidal ideation. Similarly, many of the the um, friction points with uh, things like auto reply suggestions to emails come about when the full context of a message is not understood and can be really quite quite jarring and cause other kinds of, you know, certainly feel like a mistake. In this example, we have a very serious and somber email message, and the su uh, suggested auto reply is really too positive in a way that that um, um, that is is clearly clearly wrong. Um, we have uh, the best way the uh, the first step in understanding what what we need to be doing about these types of harms is to start to categorize and understand the different ways that things go wrong. We're never really going to be, I think, super complete. There's always going to be new kinds of mistakes that are cropping up, but we can start to to um, uh, taxonomize the, the, the errors that we see and think about how they manifest and why and what we can do both at the, the algorithmic layer and at the, the application uh, and architectural layer to, to mitigate these. Of course, if we really want to understand whether something is going wrong, 
we we don't want to leave all of these mistakes to to um, uh, the user to to report and for us to discover in situ. We'd like to um, see what we can do beforehand uh, to mitigate these. Um, going back to the auto suggest, uh, uh, and this has implications for how we do even you know things that we think of as being straightforward, like crowdsourced labeling. The the ways that we understand harms uh, interact with how we ask crowds to to label them. For example, in in sometimes surprising ways, the issue here is that the context of harms can often be such that these harms are things that affect uh, uh, minorities or you know small portions, smaller portions of our of our um, uh, of our populations, and this means that uh, the majority doesn't always have the context to understand why something is problematic. Here we give a, 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 an example of, of a search query that's come in as Neil deGrasse Tyson and an auto-suggest response that, that adds in the suffix arrested. Now, it might not be clear to everybody why this is a problem, um, but um, it, uh, this, does, this raises concerns about why, about misinformation and, and the fact that this person was, was not actually arrested. And without knowing that context, it's hard for people to know that this is a potential, a potential harm. And in fact, across experiments, when we have uh, presented problematic scenarios to, uh, to uh, crowdsourced workers, we find that depending on uh, what we use to trigger the problematic reporting of a particular suggestion, the, the, the errors that we see range in um, that there's an eight to 20 percent gap in how um, incorrectly detecting the, these errors when we re rely on on majority labeling versus say um, 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 uh, labeling a suggestion as problematic if, if any user or judge mar marks it that way so uh, by by uh, changing the way that we do this crowdsource labeling, we can we can actually do uh, a much better job of detecting these harms and then integrating that into our process. Um, uh, this this is just a sampling of the different ways that we're working on our algorithmic and platform and tooling processes to improve the overall robustness of the system in in sort in all sorts of harms. In addition to the types of uh, uh, guidelines and uh, taxonomies and tooling that I talked about. We're doing work in security. We're doing work on privacy and machine learning models. We're doing work uh, um, to make these things more accessible to a broader, uh, broader groups of people to integrate into into processes around the uh, around the industry. And in the meanwhile, while we're still working to solve these problems, we found that that the best way to ensure that our AI applications are at the highest standards is is through very human oriented processes, ensuring that our initial application design teams uh, are, are diverse, that we work hard to identify all the stakeholders and brainstorm how they can be harmed uh, and what we can do about that. Um, and that we uh, really uh, uh, take kind of a, a um, uh, and that we think about these issues across the development uh, process so that we, um, um, while we come up with the, the algorithmic, the architectural, and the, the underlying kind of uh, fundamental uh, 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 research answers to these questions. To, uh, to close, um, uh, I hope that some of the work I, I presented here uh, expands uh, people's uh, perspective on on a the complexity of AI problems and how the solutions to these problems uh, often go far beyond the the algorithms. I, I hope that um, I was able to get across some of what I think of as being a critical human-centered approach to the design and development of these applications. And the theme of robust AI and and harms is is really one of these illustrations. Um, um, of the kinds of research that we do at, at MSR. I think broadly, the way that we've set up this ecosystem and this partnership with the company is representative uh, generally of how we take inspiration at MSR from real world challenges and that we use this to drive our curiosity driven research and find methods that can move the needle and then make sure that through our partnerships that we ensure that those that those research advances actually have real positive impacts for, for people. So um, thank you very much.